Hall of Fame General Manager Ron Wolf always had an affinity for the Armed Services Academies. He appreciated the honor, the dedication to duty, the discipline, and the toughness of the men who came out of those schools. In the supplemental draft of 1998, the Packers spent a second round draft choice on a midshipman from the Naval Academy, Mike Wall. Turned out to be a draft choice well spent. Well, the thing about the Naval Academy that translates so well for the NFL, I think, for, especially for guys that are kind of mediocre athletes like I was, is at the Naval Academy, you're so happy to be at football. You're so thrilled to be in that environment and be able to kind of be released from all the obligations of your daily life that you'll run through a brick wall every single day. So when it comes to work ethic, uh, perseverance, determination, all those, those characteristics that really can help you thrive in the NFL, um, I, I would come to practice every day and we'd be cutting our start, starting defensive linemen. We'd be going you know, full speed contact, tackles to the ground every single day. And so when I got here, it was a bit of an adjustment, I think, for, for the other guys because I would probably play too hard, a combination of playing too hard and not having enough skill where I was almost a, uh, I was out there, you know, potentially hurting someone. But as it, as it, got, as it got further along and I, I developed that skill and that technique, um, that work ethic really carried me through and helped me kind of accelerate my learning curve. And, Mike, you joined a team that had been to two Super Bowls, back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Reggie White was on one side. Brett Favre was on the other side. You had great offensive linemen around you. I mean, that must have been heady stuff for a, a kid to come in from the Naval Academy to that team. You know, it, it sure was, and I don't think I realized the gravity of it until you walk in the door for the first time and you see all those those figures. Um, I've, I've always told guys uh, from different teams, you know, where you get drafted is is uh, a coin flip, and I was so fortunate to be drafted not only because of the players but because of the organization in general, the way they the way they uh, their, their winning attitude, the way they help you develop as a as a as a person and and obviously on the field, but having that specific group of, of leadership and talent in the, in the locker room for those early years really shows you kind of where the bar is, what the standards is right here. Wall went on to play for three different coaches in his Green Bay career. Mike Holmgren, Ray Rhodes, and Mike Sherman. When I first got here, I, I held out, um, which was looking back, just this kind of a silly thing to do. We held out, we wanted to get, there's some terms on the contract that your that my agent wanted, uh, want to change. So by the time I got to Mike, and the first time I actually had a conversation with him was I think three weeks into training camp. And he said something to the effect of, and I'll, I'll paraphrase, he asked me a question, hey, did you get what you wanted out of the contract? And I, well, yeah, thanks coach. I, and just exploded on me. I'm not going to talk to you for the rest of the year, blah, blah, blah. You know, he, was, he, was, he was angry uh, that I had held out. He was angry at my agent. And I had to work my way back into his good graces. And I think a couple, a couple weeks of just really practicing hard and showing him that I was you know, really dedicated to improving and, and being a part of his team, he kind of opened up to me a little bit. And, and um, Mike was, the thing I always like to say about both, well, actually all three of those coaches in contrast to some of the things you see now is all those guys were teachers first. They were mm -hmm. teachers. And I think that's the most important part of, um, of coaching that we sometimes overlook is they knew how to interact on a personal level and at, a, at an organizational level and, and, to, and kind of teach these big ideas by breaking them down into simple concepts. Wall played on what I think is the best offensive line since the Lombardi Packers in Green Bay. Chad Clifton at left tackle, Mark Tauscher on the right side, Marco Rivera at left guard, Mike Flanagan at center, and Wall at right guard. They were a power blocking unit that helped Amon Green become the franchise's all time leading rusher. We took a lot of pride in that. We were, again, we were so lucky. You know, when, you, when you're in it, you think, uh, you know, that we all know that we're a cog in the wheel, but you think maybe your size cog is, is outsized, like our offensive line. And we were good, um, but certainly the, having a running back like Amon Green, having the weapons that we did outside, having Bubba Franks, having. You know, obviously Brett throwing the ball and up to Donald Driver and all these really special athletes. I mean, the, from a defensive standpoint or perspective, I really don't know what I would have done. And then you add Kevin Barry to the mix, so we added a 350-pound tight end, <laughs> and we'd go in and run uh, 96 power load 16 times a game. And it's like, what are you going to do? You know, we know, we know we're going to run it. You know we're going to run it. And, and that feeling of being so good at something – that we knew no matter if we just keep going and we know it's going to work and we just could do that time in and time out. I mean, that's that's probably the, 
you know, the best feeling in sports is knowing that we don't we don't care if you know if they're gonna run what we're gonna run. We're just gonna uh, we're gonna go out there and dominate. There was a game at Tampa, and you guys always struggled with Tampa. And this is when they yeah. were coming off the Super Bowl and everything else. But this time you went down there and you won. And I remember a drive; it had to be like 90 some yards, almost all of it on the ground. What kind of feeling was that to to be bowling over the Super Bowl champs like that at their place? You know, we were running, I, and I, I remember the drive, and I remember running uh, uh, 98, which was an outside run play to the right, a couple times, and there was a specific call that game, which is something where you, you kind of see a tendency in one of the defensive lineman's stances. And it, either it was, you know, Marco, Mark, or, or Bubba making a call over and over and again so we could get this three-man rotation and pick it up and kind of seal that outside play. And all we had to do on the backside is, is just basically try to cut off either that linebacker or defensive tackle for, for Chad and I. And I just thought – Man, if it was always this easy down here, we would have had a lot more success. But that was a great team. Uh, we certainly we enjoyed. I think when you get to a certain level in this league, you really just want to showcase your ability and play against the best, and they certainly were. Most of the players of that early 2000s era will tell you the best team they played on was the 2003 squad, the one that barely snuck into the playoffs in the final week of the regular season. The Packers then beat the Seahawks in the wild card round, setting up a divisional playoff confrontation with the Eagles in Philadelphia. That game contained a play and a moment that lives in Green Bay infamy. I've always said that that 2003 team is the best team I've ever been on, hands down. Uh, I still can't believe that we, we lost that game. And when it comes up on TV and my kids will turn it on and, and start giggling because I think there's a point where I start swearing on television and whatnot. But they, um, that, was a real, that was a real special team. We certainly, we certainly thought that uh, we were going to see Carolina in the, in the uh, championship. Um, I can't even watch that 4th that and 26 play. But the play that makes me sick to my stomach is, is the goal line play. We had a 4th and, fourth and inches on the goal line. And we called a, a new play. It was like a 92G lead. Uh, we got some penetration. I, my feet get kicked out. I trip them on. I mean, the whole thing was just complete disaster. And uh, it led to another fourth and one where I had a, uh, I'll never forget, I had a backup defensive tackle between Flanagan and I. And we had been lighting this guy up all game. And we're just pleading with Brett on the side, you know, just snap it, just snap it. And Brett did the right thing. You do what the coach calls. And, and we, we ended up punting the ball. And then they had the fourth and 26. And we just, just six in your mind is like, God, that could have been it. I wrote a, an entire chapter in a book about that. Before it was fourth and 26, it was fourth and one. Yeah. And a little over two minutes ago in the game. And as Bob McGinn, the great scribe, once uh, wrote, you know, the Eagles were so gassed that they couldn't fall off sides, much less right. jump off sides yeah. in that game. Mike, when, when the play came in and you guys knew you were just going to try to draw them off sides and then punt the ball, what was your feeling? Because oh. you, you know what I mean? And there was the halftime speech that Sherman gave that, you know, if we get another fourth and one after that goal line yeah. play right before halftime fail, we're going to ride your, the, your backsides all the way to the Super Bowl. What was the feeling at that point? That was before fourth and 26. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to collect my thoughts. It was I'm so, uh, God, we were so angry. We were so, so angry because we wanted that. Um, we believed in ourselves more than anything. We, we knew with the, the talent we had in the backfield and the guys we had up front. And quite frankly, we had played Philly the, um, earlier in the year in a Monday Night Football game, and I believe we ran for 250 that, that game, but we lost. I think this game, I know we ran it for over 200, and we lost. So getting six inches, yeah. you know, at the, it's always easy to look back and go, hey, you know, sure, this is what you should have done, right? Um, I, I'd, I'd take it to my grave that I'd, I'd bet on us every time, but you have to make the, uh, you have to, I don't have to make that call. You know, it's a, it's a, that was a Coach Sherman call, and he did what he thought was right at the time. And, you know, obviously, who thinks that a kid from UCLA is going to catch a pass, much less a fourth and 26? Yeah, exactly. It did become fourth and 26 after that for Philadelphia. But let me ask you this now you move on from the Packers eventually, go free yeah. agency, and you have some really good years with Carolina and yeah. then. Um, you know, go on to Seattle for a quick year. But talk a little bit about the other organizations you played for in comparison to Green Bay. What was the experience like? So I always, and 
Let me let me start by saying you know it was great playing for for other for other teams and and certainly uh, I felt very very lucky to finish my career in Seattle because it made me fall in love with football again. I had had some rough years in in Carolina be, really because of injury more than anything else. Um, but I'll never forget I, I signed with Carolina and there's always this you know with, uh, trepidation with leaving a place like Green Bay and we kind of thought that you know it was kind of best for my career at that point that w that we move on uh, my wife and I and. Um, I remember sitting in a residence inn in, in Charlotte uh, about four weeks later, and I called up my wife and I just said, "We we just made the biggest mistake of our careers for leaving. Really? It was just such a um, this was such a special place, and you just don't realize it till you're till you're gone. And uh, I, you know, I've I've probably told that story a million times to different people, and that's that's no disrespect to the uh, to the Panthers organization, which I think is a great organization. Um, but this is such a special place, and. And just the fact that I can still call Flea, I can call, still call Brian Angle on the phone, I can still call uh, Doc McKenzie, and you can talk to these people all the time. Um, Mark Lavat, Chris Gizzy, I, I, I talk to these guys uh, more often than I talk to anybody else in the NFL, you know. And so to have those relationships and, and be able to be in this, in this smaller community in the NFL is, is just such a special, special thing.